You know, I want to look this morning at the Word of God, and it's, it's a thought rather than a preach, and I just pray it will bless your heart, because in reading this old story, it really began to touch my own heart again. You know, the old stories are the best stories, amen? And um, I'm, I'm thinking of the story of Elijah. There's not a Christian here doesn't know the iconic story of, of Elijah, arguably, they, they say, the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Um, I don't know if that's true. He's certainly very like us because he was a man of like passions. We maybe have an idea what that means when we look at him a minute closer, but he's like this sort of lone ranger that all of a sudden springs out of the pages of the Old Testament. You know, this, this prophet that kind of comes at a time in the life of Israel when Israel had turned away from the revelation of God and turned back to the pagan gods of the societies that were around him. It was a, an immense insult to God. I mean, God who had brought his people out of, out of the darkness of Egypt. I mean, 500 years they were under bondage as slaves, and yet he sends a, a mighty deliverance through Moses. And it's not just a, a, you know, a, a sort of diplomatic mission from Moses. It's a, it's a, it's a mission of supernatural origins from beginning to end. Ten incredible plagues. Um, you know, grace, this deliverance that no man can stand and say that by our own hands have we delivered ourselves. It was the mighty hand of God. I suppose it's the same with us today, isn't it? Really, Christian, we sit down here and think, people say to me, oh, you're such a good person. I'm thinking, man, you really don't know me, do you? There's no good in me. The only, if you see anything good in me, it's Christ, amen. You know, but thanks be to God, he is in me today. And if you have asked him into your life, he is in you. So the goodness of God has justified the place. The place doesn't justify the person. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit living in you today, indemnifies you and does something powerful and supernatural, and legal in every way. It, it dots every I for God, crosses every T, that he can be your friend today because he lives in you. And yet this uh, incredible nation of God, you know, they went through immense um, times and encounters with the powers of darkness, with in demonic nations, and I use that word without qualification. We're talking about cultures that have become so emerged and submerged in darkness. Uh, it's hard and difficult sometimes for us to understand biblical rationale in the Old Testament unless you kind of have an understanding of the cultures, uh, the gods that these nations had given themselves over to. When you give yourself over to the demonic, deliberately, deliberately going over, giving yourself over your children to the, to the demonic, something begins to, to rage within those races, friends, that became so offensive to God that even though they were his creation and he loved them, that he would order that they would be extradited out of their countries and that Israel would be able to take over that land and it was immense time and yet with all the revelation with all the revelation that Israel had it in its sinful nature reverted back to the worship of the Baals you know that's an old testament God Baal Asherah was was the female sort of wife of Baal it was also believed in in their mythology that Asherah gave birth to Baal and then became his lover after that. That was tell you how perverted the, the system of Baal was. Baal was a god that had the body of a man and the head of an ox and had horns in his head and uh, was accredited with the sort of fertility and the produce of the production of the lands. And so the Jews in their in their own mythological view of life, you know, they, they really were people of the earth. They weren't people of the sea. The Jews weren't a very seagoing nation. So they feared the sea and and so they gravitated towards the earth and to the lands as a nation naturally in their in their natural biology, in their natural thinking. And so when they strayed from God, they, they were they were more appealed to worship deities that would produce from the earth and the pagan lands around them, they came into the land of Canaan, uh, uh, which was a very fertile land, uh, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Bible says. And so the gods of that region, Baal being the principal god of that region, you know, had a special appeal because, you know, fleshly gods have appealed to fleshly people. But our God not only understands, he's a power to deliver. Amen. He understands that we are but dust, but he has made a way for you to be an overcomer today. And, and so they followed after the Baals, and with the, uh, 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 with the worship of the, of the Baals came even eventual human sacrifice. 
The, uh, Molech was another name for this, the, the gods of the Baals. And it was a pluralistic god. There was several odd names given, Molech being one. But Molech became a very darker figure for Baal, where they would offer their children and child sacrifice. And part of the worship, friends, was erotic. It was sexual in nature. They, they, you know, they, they had fashioned gods after the darkness of their own thinking and then brought in a demonic influence into their life where it became to a point where they started to persecute the prophets of God and to a point where even the lamp of God, the light of God, the testimony of true religion was on the verge of being extinct in the nation of Israel. That's the back story to where we're reading of this morning. We had gone from such a height of revelation to such now where there's a hundred prophets being hidden in a cave. And that's the sum total out of the whole nation of, of believing people. A, a couple of hundred people out of the whole place dev still devoted to the worship of Yahweh, or Jehovah. And yet this time, is uh, this antichrist time, this anti-God of the Bible time has, has uh, risen to such a place where it is now becoming a very demonically led governmental system. Oh my, my, how things haven't really changed much. Amen. When we look around us in the world today, friends, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be at the end, friends. They will be marrying and giving as it was in the days of Noah, uh, when, when the, 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 the fever pitch of sin, where men called evil good and good evil, when people who stand for righteousness would be persecuted and imprisoned and turned out of their jobs, when the Antichrist system begins, which is already flooding this world, you know, with its... It with, with its badges of sin, friends, when people are going to be forced either to bow the knee to Baal again or not be able to commercially partake in society. What a test we're going to face, friends. What a time for the church to go deep in the word of God, amen, and set our roots deep into Christ because, friends, there's a fight coming, amen, and the journey is too great for you. I'm just speaking this morning from Elijah, of course, from First Kings and chapter, I'm going to do quite a long reading, so I hope you can just, for many of you who are new to the Lord, I want to give a background to the story. This is your Old Testament. This is, this is a couple of thousand years before Jesus arrived. This is the, the storyline of how, uh, how history unfolded and how God elected a people to himself, you know, to bring forth a Savior into the world. And we know the Savior, as you would know now, is Jesus Christ. But the nation of Israel was the vehicle in which God in the sovereignty elected to bring forth the Savior of the world. And all the prophecies of the Old Testament, the old books of the Bible, all point forth to this thing that God brought a people and to that people he gave a revelation of himself not just in, in, in philosophy or, or, or religious doctrine but an actual manifestation they actually saw the very glory of God friends they, they saw the Shekinah glory of God come down into the temple they saw you know events happening it was like a theocracy there was a time in the history of mankind and the development of civilizations and nations where God actually physically intervened into the world and gave himself a testimony in the nation it's an amazing thing that that testimony began to fan out abroad to the darker world around them that there was a God in Israel. You know, to, to, to such a point that even many years later, the uh, Queen of Sheba came and to, to hear about the wisdom and the God of Israel. Uh, the, you know, other nations, ne even Nebuchadnezzar, you know, a whole chapter given to one of his speeches in the Bible. Even he, the great Nebuchadnezzar that had conquered the known world at the time, had an encounter with the same God and, and was inquiring. But, you know, men before darkness rather than light because of their deeds are evil. There's something that is bent in humanity that we always try to dress up our sin that's the failure and so and if we can't if we can't fix our sin we indemnify it we we give it an excuse or, and then we find a religion or a philosophy that you know begins to support our false narrative about about our failures i just want to praise god but this is a story of of a of a, a great man of god that went through a very dark time who here understands or knows that Sometimes the righteous people of God can go through some very, very difficult moments. <clears throat> then it happens, our word, 1 Kings 18, verse 18, sorry, verse 17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Now, sorry to give you the background of that. Uh, Elijah has broken onto the scene already. He is... He has prophesied and made a pronouncement over the land of Israel that there would be no water or dew until he again comes back and lifts that, that embargo of, of those elements. And so what happened for three and a half years, the, the, 
the, com the commerce of the country uh, disintegrated, famine set in, there was, there was an upheaval, there was terrible hardship, animals were dying. We saw here just over the summertime here in Ireland, just with three reasonable sort of months of weather, we were rationing water, the, 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 the grass was going yellow and, and dying, and that was just three months, friends. They had three and a half years in a, temp in a climate that was much, much hotter than our climate, and things got very, very bad, but it was a sanction of God against the nation, not because God hated them, because he wanted to sober them up, amen. You know, and sometimes these chastisements can still come to nations, it can come to individuals, it can come to churches, not because God is partially angry with you, it's because God wants to turn you from the folly of your way. And so when he came with this prophecy that there was going to be no water or dew, I'm sure people ridiculed it, but then when it began to set in, they began to realize that they were in a war against God, friends. And uh, so Ahab, who was known in the Old Testament as some passages of scripture said he was the most wicked king. I think there was other ones that surpassed him, but I think up to that point, for absolute sure, Ahab was a wicked king. He'd married Jezebel. That's an infamous word, uh, infamous name as we know it. But if you're called the Jezebel today, somebody is not complimenting you. Amen. They're saying something not very nice about you. And so he married Jezebel, and she was a Sidonian. Not that she liked Sidon or anything like that, but she was from the land of Sidon. And uh, the Sidon's gods were, was Baal and Asherah. And so she, he imported into marriage uh, a whole worldview of religion, sensual, uh, sensuality, um, wickedness, and all the evil flooded. And Ahab was delighted. Ahab was, I'm sure, like every carnal man, delighted to be taken away with his lusts and, and, and have religion tell him it's okay to be sexually perverse. That's what it was, friends. That was the religion of the time. You can be as sexually perverse as you want to be, and you can be right with God. Does that sound like the hour that we're living in today? Things don't change. We, we dress it up in a different way, but the nature of people, since the time that God created us in the garden after the fall, is exact, has been exactly the same. You, 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 there's no reinvention. That's why I love the Bible. The Bible is, such, is so accurate to human behavior and the nature of people. But it, it points you out to the steadfast love of God, that God chases, not that we chase God, but that he chases us, amen. I mean, God could turn his back at the whole Johnny thing and say, to, to hell with them all. You know, I've, I've given them life. I've given them revelation. And look, they still want perversion. They still want darkness. They want to interact with demons. They want to interact with perversity. To heck with them. Go away. But God loves you and I, friends, amen. And even when we are found in dark places of our own making, he still chases us down. Such is the miraculous love of God. It's unfathomable, really. It's really very hard to get or even a true understanding of that without a revelation of the Holy Spirit because it's, it is very mind-boggling. And so we have this time where now Elijah has come back. God has given the, the word to go meet King Ahab. And of course, that's going to be a bit of an icy meeting. So he calls him the troubler of Israel. And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all of Israel to me on Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets and 50 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? You know, there's some here this morning, you're faltering. You're, you're in here this morning, you know the righteousness of God, but you're listening to a false religious thinking, friends. You're listening to false arguments. You're listening to voices that are not godly, that are not righteous, that will bring you down a pathway of absolute destruction. And we're listening in all forms of places. Unfortunately, those voices, sometimes we can't stop them, but we should not entertain them. They're on the internet, they're in the school place, they're in the workplace, friends. But we must understand that we only bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Amen. When Jordan got up this morning, and Jerry got up this morning, what they said to you, we give our money as well because we're devoted to Christ. We are devoted people to the Lord. And so all the people that came out and he said, How will you how will you fall? How long will you fall to pertain two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. Amen. If Baal is God, then I follow him. And the people didn't say a word. And Elijah said to the people, I alone am left as a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let's give us two bulls and let, let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces and lay it on wood and put it under the, under, and put, 
put fire under it, and I, but put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. Then you will call upon the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, wow, this is well spoken. And they were an intelligent lot, weren't they? And uh, now, now Elijah, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many and call upon the name of your God, and, uh, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and they called upon the name of Baal until morning till evening, saying, oh Baal, hear us. And there was no voice and no one answered and they leaped about on the altar and, uh, which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and cried uh, uh, and said, cry aloud, cry louder, uh, for, he, for he is a God, he is either meditating or he is busy. Or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. Actually, one of the translations actually said maybe he's sitting on the toilet. You know, yeah, you know, it's funny, you know, I mean, he started to really ridicule these guys, you know. The reality is that we don't win people to Christ by ridiculing them, but I'm telling you, sometimes, friends, sometimes I falter a little bit in that department, amen, because I'm asked to swallow such stupidity, Amen. I'm really asked to swallow such stupidity that sometimes I falter and I do ridicule. God forgive me, amen. But anyway, we are, that's why Elijah was a man of light passions. He was a bit of crack, friends, you know. He actually saw, he called a spade a spade. I think he was kind of Irish. <clears throat> but anyway, so they cried out and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And by midday was past, they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. I want to tell you, anapromorphic gods will never answer you. What I mean by that is gods of your own making, gods of your own understanding. You can sit in your bar stool in Ireland and dream up your understanding of who God is, but when you pray, are in need and you pray to that God, you'll get no answer because he doesn't exist, amen. There's only one God, and his name is Jesus Christ, amen. Then Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel, <clears throat> saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seers of seed. That's roughly two bath loads of seed. And he, and he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood, laid it on the wood, and he said, Fill the water pots and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time, and they did it a second time, and do it a third time, and, and they did it a third time. And the water ran all around the altar, and also into the trench was filled with water. And it came to pass, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in heaven, and I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up all the water that was in the trench. Now when the people saw it, they fell in their faces and they cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. I tell you this morning, take heart, friends, because an entire nation that had fallen under the spell of false religions and false ideology, a, a political system that had risen up and then indemnified lies throughout the community, at one event in history, God turned it all back, amen. You know, no matter how evil the hour becomes today, I want to tell you, the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is still the power of God unto salvation. I'm telling you, friends, today there is more on our side than there is on their side today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So take heart, Christian, if you think that all is lost in our nation today. And I'm telling you, friends, on the outset, you can look at it and you can despair in your heart when we see now going to be unleashed in our nation and I mean unleashed, friends, a savagery that we have never understood in this country before, where the unborn will be killed right up to the age of birth, friends. 
right in the whole sin in our own country when we see perversions of humanity being indemnified as godly and good. I want to tell you straight, friends, don't despair. The gospel can take a bad man and make him into a good man. All it needs is a man or a woman to believe God and for God to move upon their life and everything can change. Hallelujah. Oh God, raise up another, another Elijah. Raise up another Billy Graham, oh God. Another Reiner Bonke, oh God. Do it again, oh God. That should be our prayer, oh God. Do it again. Raise up from your people a voice, a prophetic voice, a demonstrative voice that men and women will be cut to the very heart and will turn back to Christ. And so at one event, one mighty event where God came, the entire nation was summoned. There was well over a million people there, friends. And that nation piled in to see this incredible climactic uh, uh, battle of the titans. Well, it really wasn't the battle of the titans because they are no gods at all, amen. There was really no contest, friends. You know, they are blow-away arguments and they are blow-away religion. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, friends. Hallelujah. Still changing lives, still healing lives. And, and so this a mighty event takes place. But I want to see you to see the human cost of this. Here you have this man, and he is he's sold out for God. He's given to God. You know, he stands in an hour that really, friends, it's not popular and are safe. It's certainly not paying good. I mean, the best he had out of it was three years living at a brook being fed by ravens. I don't know about you, but I don't particularly like crows. I certainly wouldn't like to be fed by them. You know, and that was his life. You know, he didn't have any pay packet coming in the door. He didn't have any health care. He was uh, le left in isolation for three and a half years, living by a brook, which God had manufactured for him and been fed by birds of the air. And not at all the world of Astoria. You know, the Bible says, talks about those who the world, wouldn't, you know, did not count worthy, but endured such hostilities for the sake of the testimony of Christ. Hebrews 11 is such a tremendous chapter of the Bible for you to read about that. And he comes out of it what it was, this quarantine place, this haven, this, this little oasis that God had prepared for him and back into the fight again. And here he faces the king and now the climactic challenge up in Carmel, everything seems to have gone wonderfully well. Textbook, I mean, really, Elijah should be absolutely rejoicing. But this man actually gets to a place where he's actually exhausted, friends. He is mentally and emotionally at a place where he has had the greatest victory and the greatest manifestation of his life. But very quickly in the back of that, there is an emotional, physical, and mental collapse of this man. You know, he, he gathered up on this mountain. It, we can read the detail very easy, but he built this altar himself with his own hands. You know, he got 12 large stones. I don't know if you have ever had to gather 12 large stones these stones could be, you know, 60, 70 pounds, 80 pounds weight. It could be 100 pounds weight each, who knows, and, and bring them and, and build an altar and, and then cut wood and lay it on it. And then he had to slaughter a bullock. Then he had to butcher it all in the middle of the heat. After all, you know, the pressure of the people, the pressure of the moment around him. And yet God answered with fire and the nation turned to him. That's wonderful. But there was a cost to this as well, friends. The man, the man in his own physical condition, his own mental condition, hit a bruising time. Verse chapter 19, this is, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and even more also, if I do not make your life as one of the lives of, of them by tomorrow around this time. And when he had saw that he had arose, when he had saw this, he arose and he ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. What an what an interesting. See, I don't know about you, but I actually like to read the the full narrative of the scripture. Not just the Mount Carmel and everyone puts their knees up and says, well, this is wonderful. But this is a man who actually get to a place now, friends, where dying seemed easier than living. And that's actually the title of my message this morning, when dying seems easier than living. And there might be like an oxymoron to many of us this morning, this should not be the portion of a Christian. 
A Christian should always be on the mountaintops. But friends, I'm telling you, Jesus said, no man is greater than his master. If they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. And the Apostle Peter tells me, armor says that suffering will be part of the journey. We are devoted, friends. We are part of the army of God. We are being brought into the very army of God because there is a battle that we have to stand in. And we have a real enemy. And we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. We all go through struggles. And here's this man. After struggling, after being faithful to the testimony of God, he is now at a place where mentally that one more battle seems to be the straw that breaks the back. You would have imagined after seeing such a mighty demonstration of the power of God when this vindictive uh, edict comes out of Jezebel that you would imagine that he would have stood on the word of God and he would have just said, you tell that cow to come down here and we'll deal with her. Amen. But no, friends, there was a time sometimes in all of our lives where there's a, a break in your emotions. You just can't take another battle. You've gone to the edge. You have been used by God mightily, and you end up in burnout. And many people end up in burnout. And, you know, and if you don't earn a burnout in your youth, there can be times in your life as you get older. The Bible says even the young men will utterly faint because you won't always be young. And there's this time in his life, and he, he is now mentally worn down. I don't know, maybe you're all different than me here biologically, but I get mentally worn down. Anyone else want to be honest this morning? Raise a hand and just say, Pastor, I've been there. I understand what you're on about. Well, you're in good company. Amen. You're not outside of the will of God today, friends. Despite your failures and despite what, you appear to be, what appears to be failure, God is still in control, amen. And he's still in control of your life. And it's, your life is not over. And your testimony is not gone in Jesus' name, amen. We often go through struggles. Often it feels like nobody fully understands, friends. Sometimes these battles, you know, they intensify to the point where thoughts of death seem better than thoughts of living. I, I know what that feels like. Much of you might live in mystery and think Pastor Nick has always got it good. But I can tell you, friends, I've gone into bartering with God. I'm happy to go now as long as you look after my wife and make sure my grandkids all know you and you, look, uh, and you can take me. I, I don't know, does anyone live like that? Maybe this might sound like heresy to some, but I want to tell you, friends, they are thoughts that are common to us. Some think that debt is a reasonable solution. They are the only solution to escape uh, their anguish. I've met people who have constantly battled with their inner despair for such a long time that they begin to entertain dark thoughts. This was one of the mightiest men of the Bible, friends. He prayed for death. He went through the greatest victory. Nobody in the history of Israel saved Moses, not even the great Samuel saw such a move of God where at one point in history, the entire nation is one to God. Amazing. The, the, this is an epic. I've actually been on top of Mount Carmel. I've been to the supposed site where this has all happened. Faces down looking onto the Megiddo Valley. It's actually an investment into your life if you ever can get to go and visit the Holy Land. I'm not one of these sort of Medjugorje and magical places, but Israel is, friends, is an investment into your life. If you can, instead of going to Spain next year, go to the Holy Land and just begin to see the, the place, the footprint of where our Savior walked and where the events happened. It's an investment to you. But I've been on Mount Carmel. I've heard all the stories. Much of our dark thinking is due to natural burnout. It can surface when a person feels that they have failed to the point of no recovery. And that's what happened to Elijah. Elijah got to a stage and said, my goodness, after seeing such an enormous demonstration of the power of God and having been a partaker of it, at, at a moment I hear this negativity from Jezebel, I run like a coward. And in the face of it, friends, it is cowardly. This is a man who knows better. This is a man who commands the power of God. This is a man that can shut up rain from the sky and dew from the earth. This is a man that can bring fire down upon the sacrifice. And yet, because of one demonic edict, one attack across his bow, he runs like a coward, friends. There's no doubt about it, it's cowardly. But you ask yourselves why? He's a man. He's weak. All men are weak. 
If there's anything great you see in a man, it's not the man, it's God, it's Christ. Thank God Jesus went to Calvary, not because we were strong, but because we were weak. That's the gospel. It, it just shaves us all down to the very same place, friends. Needy people. But yet God is concerned for you. Amen. He was burnt out. He'd worked a hard day. It wasn't like us, some of us pastors that are overweight and uh, only get to do a bit of work when the scaffold goes up Tuesday and we'll be all up to fixing up the Christmas tree. This man had to work hard in the heat of the sun. The mental burden of the nation, the word on him, understanding how great the, the, the stakes were high, friends. The testimony of God, the promise of a Savior. It was high. He understood how high that testimony was. He understood that every demon of hell was pitted against the plan of God to subvert the plan of God through demonic nations and through infiltration into the religion and to, you know, if you can't beat them from without, you beat them from within. And it's the same today, friends. If the enemy can't take us down from without, he'll take us from within. He'll try to infiltrate the church with either false doctrine or false brethren to discourage the heart of the people. That's always the way, but he understood the enormity. If there was a man that absolutely grasped the hour that he lived in, and, he, and friends, there is an immense emotional battle for you and I as Christians that the world knows nothing of. They contend with none of this. They don't understand. They're like no better than the animal that just goes out to graze and get their food and get their high and go back to work for more. But we have come into an understanding of what the fight is, friends. The battle for men's lives. The battle for the realm and the testimony of Almighty God for our brothers and sisters who don't know the Lord, our families that are far from God. He understood the enormity and that pressure upon him. And the physical enduring and working and lifting stones and cutting up a bullock. And, 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 you know, a bullock is a pretty big beast. He just got run down, friends. Burned out. But when he ran, the sense of disappointment in himself. I want to die. I'm, I'm no better than the people I was speaking to. Have you ever felt like that as a Christian? I want to die. I'm no better than my next door neighbor who doesn't know God. I just said something to my wife or my husband. That's, I thought I was free of that sort of thinking and free of that sort of manifestation. Now something very unflattering comes out of me and, and, and I'm caught out and it's visible and the neighbors have heard it and my children have seen it. And all of a sudden it's out there and you feel, my God, whatever of the great things you've done in my life and my testimony and my deliverances and the deliverance of the nation, I'm no better than my ancestors. I'm no better than the people around me. I am useless. My life is washed up. I'm of no value. I'm a coward. I run from the battle. That's how this man felt. He felt it was easier to die than it was to live. Elijah was a great man of God. Full of zeal for truth. He intentionally wanted to live a life to fulfill God's pro promises in his life and for his life, friends. No one can deny that about this man. But he ended up in a dark place, in a wilderness. No one around him, sitting under a juniper tree, wishing for death. He was spiritually and physically burnt out. When you're burnt out, friends, small things become enormous. You know, more hills turn into mountains. You know, little hills turn into Everest. Things we would normally brush off and become like, they become like Everest to us. We can't seem to get over even the small things around us. Things irritate us. Things that in your, you take in your stride now, you, get, you just can't take it. Friends, there's burnout going on. There's an attack going on in your life. It can be biological. It can be mental. It can be emotional. But I'm telling you, friends, it can also be spiritual. And we need to be able to identify what's going on in our lives. Some of these things that we've, we, we encounter are no different than anyone else biologically. They're purely physical. Only hours before Elijah was on top of the mountain challenging the evil of Baal worship, pleading with Israel to turn back to God. And after his hours of building his own altar and butchering a beast and putting it on there, and, and even though he experienced such a victory, yet he ended up running and collapsing. In absolute fatigue. He got to the point where he really preferred the notion of death over life. Well, there's many reasons, friends, but I think there's a few that stand out why these things can happen. He had an image of himself 
that was similar to what many of us have about ourselves. An idea of how we think our lives should be. You know, oh, what a wonderful testament you have. Oh, here, when I hear Brother So and so's testament, how God delivered them. What a great man of God you are. What a great woman of God you are. God has done a work in your life. I know that's true. But with that can come a sense of pride, friends. Pride always comes before a fall. You find yourself overpowered or running from the evil of the enemy. A sense of hopelessness, hopelessness fills your heart. And you conclude, I'm no better than my peers. I'm no better than my family. I'm no better than society, the neighbors, I've already said, next door. Here I am on the run from the enemy. I'm a failure. Take my life. I see no purpose in it. What an awful place to get to. And I've dealt with many people. Many, many people, and I've had to deal with the darkness of my own mind at times, friends, as well, in these very same sense, self-effacing thoughts that come upon us. But they're real, and they're common. Elijah feared the anger of God. He had witnessed God's judgment on other peoples and who had discarded his covenant and his testimony, and he had a sense of, I've let God down, so God's angry with me. I might as well die now. And that's how we feel. We're angry with ourselves. God's angry with us. I'm a failure. And these thoughts begin to fill us and overwhelm us and depress us and push us down. It's amazing. The angel came and he woke up, woke him and he says, arise and eat. And friends, you may be at a place this morning where you need to partake again in that place of, of receiving that real bread that comes down from heaven. You know, we break bread here and it's a place of meeting. It's a place of fellowship with God. It's a place of where we meet and the meeting becomes to the spirit because we begin to feed upon the victory. We begin to feed upon the long suffering of God. The demonstration of his love to us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. While we profaned and at our weakest point, at our most deviant place in our being, he came and he rescued us, friends. That's why we begin to feed upon Christ. And the angel said to him again, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. And I want to tell each and every one of you this morning, not not in any way to discourage you, but to encourage you. That the journey is too great for you, but not for him. That there is a feasting, there's a drawing in and a drawing near. There is a provision for you in the midst of what will be some of the most difficult times in your life. That God has made a way for you to have fellowship with you. To sustain you, to help you. He knows that you are but clay friends. He knows that you are formed out of dust. But I want to tell you the journey is too great for you. But he has put a promise upon you, amen. That what he has started, he will perfect. What he has begun in you, he will bring to completion. That's not just about the testimony of the church, friends. That's for you. That is for you and for me today. That he who began that good work within you will be faithful to complete it. And, you know, Elijah at that place where he's not at that place because theologically he's got most of it right but some of it wrong. He's absolutely one of these people. As long as I'm on the mountaintop, I'm in the will of God. But I want to tell you, friends, the psalmist says, if I take the wings of the morning or if I descend into the very depths of the sea, even there your right hand is with me. See, David definitely had a revelation of this, friends. There's no doubt about it. David, you know, all those year, year, years earlier had a revelation of what that actually meant, friends. To understand, because he had an intimacy with Christ. He had an intimacy with God as a young boy of 14 and 15 years of age. With his harp on the grassy slopes of Bethlehem. Looking after his father's few sheep friends. He began to write down thoughts of God. Revelations that he had of him. Began to call out to the name of Jehovah. And God began to meet him there. And even though he was a man that failed in many ways friends. He had understood that intimate place with God. He had a testament to draw him. But all Elijah... He had a small twist in his theology. God's angry with me now. 
And it's amazing. I won't read the rest of the reading because I've got to run out of time. But it's a beautiful read. The angel says, arise and eat for, for the journey is too great for you. And he, he, he ate and he drank and he strengthened himself and he endured for 40 more days. And he went to a place and, and all of a sudden he begins to see these supernatural manifestations like earthquakes. The earth began to quake and volcanic quakes and winds and turbulence. And of course, he's feeding into his narrative, isn't it? God's angry with me. God's thundering against me. And I want to tell you, friends, but God wasn't in it. Hallelujah. God wasn't in the wind. Amen. And God's not in that notion about you today. You need to discount that straight away from your mind. You are not disqualified because of your failure, friends. You are not relegated to second place and second best in the kingdom of God. That is not substantiated by the word of God. The word of God does not align with such a spirit. Amen. God wasn't in the earthquakes. And it's amazing. God could have spoke to him. Yeah, you big old black are you? Oh, you big heap, you big waster. You know, how many men do I, do I trust like I trusted you? And you run like a coward and you turn the victory into a defeat within 24 hours. Actually, within hours. He could have rubbed his nose in it. But he came to him in a still small voice. Oh, hallelujah. And then it's like saying, you know, you got the wrong idea, son. That's not who I am. I love you with an everlasting love. I have ingrained you on the palms of my hand. When you walk through the waters, I will be with you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. I've knit you together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now stand up, son. You still have to speak for me. You need to go and you need to start anointing others. You need to get Jehu. You're going to have to anoint him because he's going to have to take the kingship for a while. You're going to, you know, I'm not angry with you. And you know, friends, when you start to understand in your moment, and there'll be many of them in life, if they haven't hit you already, you just live a bit longer and come see me when you're in real need. And when they are, there'll be a comfort that only the Holy Spirit. Can. See, friends, I really don't know how the world gets by without this. I understand why they hit the bottle. I really do. I understand why they hit the pills. I actually really do. Because they have absolutely no hope in life. But we have the comforter, friends. We have the Holy Spirit, the Paracletus, the one who comes alongside. The one who will send another. Jesus said, I will send you another comforter, another of the same kind, just like me. It's the same kind. He's with you, but soon he's going to be in you. And we saw in Acts chapter 2 that Holy Spirit fell. And from that moment on, friends, regeneration came. Men were born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to reside in Christ. had not yet been glorified, but he was at Pentecost. And that's when the Holy Spirit came and regeneration of the truest sense. With the indwelling Holy Spirit. And what a mystery of mysteries. What a doctrine that we don't teach enough, hear enough, understand enough, or even take time to listen to enough. That the Holy Spirit lives in you. You're body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wherever you've gone last night, whether it was a pit or whether it was a pub, friends, God went with you. You might have grieved him in that journey. You might have hurt yourself in that journey, but he says, I'm there for you. What a God we serve. His idea that is an angry, virtual God. And all the lightnings, how amazing it must have been to him when we spoke to him in a whisper. Reassuring him, comforting him. God's not angry with him. This has to be a reminder to you and I this morning. When you get tired, when you grow war weary, friends, when you fail, you may easily get the sense in your heart that God is angry with you. I understand completely Whitfield and I understand sinners in the hands of an angry God and I understand how the seasons of the Holy Spirit will use aspects to convict certain congregations and places, friends. But I want to tell you today, God's not angry with you because he took all his anger out in Christ. He's got nothing but love for his people. And the anger of God is not the anger of judgment. The anger of God is the anger of correction. Angry to see what sin will do to you and what it will do to our families and take away our joy and our peace and our victory. He's angry when he's made so much provision for you to walk in liberty and life. He's angry that you're not in that place, not with you, but with the powers of sin, friends. And he comes in his kindness to you. You have to simply get away from that lie this morning. The scripture does not bear witness I have loved you, Jeremiah 31, 3. Beloved, when we fail, he picks us up. 
His arm of mercy is not so short. When Jesus went to Calvary to die for you, he didn't go because you were strong, because I said, or at the start of this message, because you were weak. Sometimes a part of our sense of failure is our own pride, thinking we can do it on our own. And the fact is that you can't, and you were never meant to. Salvation wasn't picking you up out of the pit, cleaning you off, giving you a new robe, and putting a Bible under your arm and says, now, if you can get to there, you're going to be okay, son. I want to tell you, he bears you up on eagle's wings. He takes you like he took Mephibosheth, who couldn't walk, friends. He not only took him out of uh, lo, lo me from that place of, of, of shame and, and, and darkness and ostracization, a dispossessed son of a king. He not only took him and put a robe on him, he brought him and he set him in the heavenly place. He set him at the king's table, friends. That's the promise of the new covenant. Hallelujah. It's not that I'll pick you up, I'll clean you off. All religions will guarantee you that. But you must make it from here to there. I will walk the journey with you. And when you cannot walk, I'll carry you. Thank God for his mercy for you and for me today. And don't let the devil fill your mind with his lies. He's a liar. And he always is. And he comes and uh, tells you, friend, it's nothing new. He's, just, he's getting a little bit better at it, a little bit more sophisticated with it. But you know, as we begin to educate ourselves in the word of God, friends, we are not mindless of his strategies. Another reason why thoughts of death can attack your mind is because God has a plan for your life and the devil is seeking to destroy you. And I want to address that this morning with you, friends. You are the light of the world. You are the city on a hill. The testimony of Christ is elected by God to shine through you. So wherever you are, you give God a location. Where is God in Cork City? You've heard me say a million times before, well, he works in McDonald's. Actually, I think he works in Tesco's. I passed him at the till. You give him a location. And so the enemy will always come against you. And you and I, friends, are not just in any, we're not in any ordinary old world, friends. We are in a spiritual battle. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And as soon as you begin to begin to embrace that reality, friends, that this is not just some sort of intellectual concept, some sort of ritual that we live, some sort of things that we just do. We are brought into an army and we are in a fight and we are on the front row. Amen. The devil sees you and he sees you as a threat to his kingdom. He sees you to a threat to the school that he's placed you in, the family he has you in, the community that you're in. He sees you as a threat. He knows that Christ is in you. He knows the possibilities of your testimony in your life is enormous. He's going to try to take you out, so don't be mindless of his devices, friends. Understand that you are in a war. And let's declare war back in Jesus' name. Let's not be on the back foot anymore. So if you want to fight, you got it, sister, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You start to use the power in the name of Jesus. You start to draw from the word of God. You start to strengthen yourself in God. You start to know because the journey is too great for the natural man. But the spiritual man, it is overcoming the, the flesh, the world, and the devil in Jesus' name. Amen. Thoughts of death can attack your mind because I want to tell you, friends, the devil wants to take you out. He wants to take you out. And that's all she wrote about you. He took his life. She took her life. And if it's not just taking your life physically, it's pulling yourself out of the battle. It's, you know, it's like you're dead to the work. And you're dead to the purpose. You've, and your life has no sense of reason or purpose. You know, that's what leads to a lot of despair with people. We all know it. When the devil says, you have no purpose. You have so publicly messed up. You have so done it, friends, and everybody knows about you. Oh, yeah, you preached a great message, or you did a great thing for God. But look how you ran in the face of adversity. You know, friends, you have to, you have to look that lie in the eye and say, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son. I want to tell you, there's nothing that you have done or I have done or the sum total of what we've done together can eclipse the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. It is not bigger than one drop of Jesus' blood, friends. The sum total of all our misdeeds together can never overpower in God's economy. The blood of his son is far more important, far more powerful, far more meaningful than your sin. Don't ever stand in the presence of God and insult God the Father and say, well, your Jesus' blood isn't strong enough to indemnify and set me free. I'm telling you, that would probably get you a clatter or two from God. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's the biggest insult. That is an insult, friends, that is beyond measure. And yet he endures it all the time. What a clatter in the face of God to say my failure and my weakness has somehow relegated the blood of Jesus into neutral zone and it cannot be effectuous for me right now. What an insult. Oh God, have mercy on us. It's not the failure of the flesh, friends. It's the failure to understand that the blood of Jesus cleanses you from every sin. Indemnifies you as a child of the living God. But your pride because you think you have to measure up to something. I tell you, we take dents and Elijah was a pride issue. I am no better than my fathers. Well, whatever made him think that he was. And I want to tell you, you're no better than anybody here, but you're also no worse than anybody here. There's a kind of comfort to that. What makes a man or a woman great is Christ in them, the hope of glory. And I'm here to tell you this morning by the Holy Spirit, he's in you. And if he's not in you, you need to get right with him this morning. You need to call upon him. You need to turn from your own stupidity and your own thinking because your own thinking is going to get you more of the same. Nowhere, fast. But you bow the knee and that's humbling yourself. And then no one else can save me but Jesus Christ because nobody else can. All the king's horses and all the king's men will not put Humpty together again, friends. I don't care how much you try to stick your life back together. I don't care how many New Year's resolutions, how much determination you have. You will grow old fast and you will sink and you will, you will dissolve in your own self-pity. Don't be so surprised that your mind is under attack, Christian. But equally, do not be surprised to re reawake the truth that in Christ you have been given the power to stand up and resist the enemy. You see, friends, this is where I want to get to this morning. I understand this failure, and I don't want to emphasize on our failures and our weaknesses. I want to, I want to tell you this morning there is power in the name of Jesus. We are dealing with a series here out of Revelation 5. When John took, talked about that scroll being opened with its seven seals. And we understand that, of course, is the plan of salvation to the world. But our lives have got seals on them too. When we come to him, oh, the seals of the seven sins of lust and pride. We're going to be dealing with lust on Wednesday. So maybe if you want to really have a look at something that's common to everybody and see what are the Bible's antidotes to that, get along Wednesday night. That's a plug for Wednesday night. But I want to tell you, friends, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. He not only forgives sin, friends, he breaks the power of it. Amen. You have to reawaken the truth that Christ is in you today. Stand up and say no. Say no to the enemy. No to the voices. Say no in Jesus' name. I refuse that narrative. I refuse to be boxed in in that place. I stand upon the word of God. I stand upon the testimony of Christ. You can stop this downward spiral, friends. You are not hopeless. You are not powerless. As a child of God, you have power to say from now on, no further in Jesus' name. Whatever that means for you. Whatever battle you're in today. Whatever retreat zone you've retreated into today. Whatever dark feelings assail your mind. You can say right now, right from this moment on, Satan, I say no in Jesus' name. I refuse fleshly solutions. I refuse demonic thoughts about me. And I embrace what Christ says about me. And I want to tell you, friends, your economic situation may not change. Your matrimonial system situation may not change. But something will change here. A compensation that comes from heaven into your very soul, friends. That gives you that song in the night. Sweet are the songs in the night. Night is not always given talking about a dark time. But the sweetest songs can be sung in those places, friends. Arise and eat. Get into God's word again. Come on. Man shall not live in bread alone. Get back into Eating the word of God. Get it back in. It's the grace of God for you and me today, friends. Get back into prayer. And talking to God. Listening for his voice. He'll surely speak to you. He will surely speak to you, friends. He hasn't went to all this effort in sending his son. And this incredible plan not to speak to you and to shun you. Read the account of other people like Elijah. Get some good testimony books, testimony books out, friends. Begin to read about what God has done in other people's lives who have maybe fallen worse than you. Who maybe have ended up in a darker place than you, but yet 
found the truth in God. And understood that they were in a spiritual fight. And began to rearm themselves in the things of the spirit. Read the accounts of other people, friends. If you refuse to stand on the bloodstained ground, you will live a life constantly dragging yourself through sorrow. Oh, my word. Constantly repining. Constantly, friends, dragging your sorrow upon sorrow in your journey. You will never seem to have any meaning or purpose in your life. The reasons you're being attacked is because you are a threat to Satan, friends. And you need to start pointing up to him. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's bullying you for too long. And you need to stand in the name of Jesus. And you know, you don't have to do the fighting. Christ will do the fighting, but you have to stand. You stand up this morning. And you look at the enemy in the eye and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. Not, the, not I that rebuke you, but the Lord rebuke you. And we battle not against flesh and blood. And say, God of heaven, send a very heavenly host this morning to absolutely put the enemy to flight. Take authority in the name of Jesus, friends. Take authority in the fact that you are a child of God. That's an immovable proposition from heaven for you. Start to stand on that bloodstained ground, friends. And don't be defined by your past. Don't let that define you because God doesn't let it define you. Don't be boxed in. You know, don't be thinking that God's angry. Elijah had to emancipate to those places, those emotional wars that were going on in him. And get to that place where that still small voice arises in each for the journey is too great for you. And then, friends, as you begin to draw from the word of God, as you begin to come back and speak to God, give yourself a place where God can speak to you. Then you begin to hear those voices. Hey, son, hey, daughter, I need you to go and Bring a word of encouragement to this brother here. Me? I'm the one needing the encouragement. No, 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 you don't realize it. You have a testimony now. Because I've kept you. I brought you back. And you can go and say, I'm the most broken man in this church. I'm the most broken woman in this place. I'm the, Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. You know, he, you know, he felt that. I don't, think he read that. I don't think he wrote that down out of some sort of hollow self-effacing. He was a man that I'm sure had many times when the enemy threw back in his face I'm sure he saw many times the faces of the children that watched in horror as he dragged the parents men and women up at the head of here and probably had them beaten to an inch of their life and executed later on all in his his his, uh, his enthusiasm for Judaism I'm sure there was many times when he went through the towns and villages that he said I can't go in there I just can't go I can't look at those people the chief of sinners friends but I'm telling you friends he understood the grace of God he understood that the blood was much more powerful than his failure. And when we get a revelation of that, friends, the blood has not lost its power. You know, the Bible says, in my name, Jesus said, you should cast out devils, Mark 10. You know, you have a power in the name of Jesus to cast out and come against the powers of darkness. I'm not saying that everything that comes against you is from the devil, friends. There is biological contagions. You, you might be living a life that's a little bit upside down. In other words, you're not getting proper night's sleep and the mountains have become more hills. There might be biological, go to your doctors, but there is a place for you and I that the world doesn't face and it's a spiritual battle. And I believe for many of you here, you need to discern that you're in a battle. And when those dark feelings of death come upon you, you have to say, this is the enemy. And I stand against him. And I treat him with all the contempt he deserves. The liar, the father of lies. The Bible says in Romans 8, 36, you are more than conquerors. You know, Jude tells us, he says, you beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Come on, the journey is too great for you. But build yourself up on the Holy Ghost today. Praying, the Holy Ghost, the Word of God, Christian fellowship. Oh, intimacy with Christ. Friends, you will be absolutely amazed. You will stand amazed and you will stand and testify in this house, I promise you, if you begin to strengthen yourself in the things of God because the journey is too great for you. You will stand and testify of the faithfulness of God. You will talk about the valleys. You will say, they're not places I want to go back in, but I don't fear them because when I walk through the valley, the shadow that I'll fear no evil because thou art with me. We're in the battle, friends. It's not against the flesh. It's against the spiritual darknesses that are in the heavenly realms. Now those darknesses have become more manifesting in the hour that we live in. We are now living in a demonically inspired society. The good is called evil and evil is called good. And that's why the devil has tried to take you out and silence you. Because you know what the stakes are. You know, just like Elijah is, how 
real the issue is. You know the souls of men and women hang in the balance of God's testimony. And I pray for us that we would get real. That we would see a cross that is greater than the sum total of all our failures this morning. And that we would, just as the angel came and touched Elijah and said, the journey is too great for you. I want to tell you, friends, the Christian life is not an easy life. It's an impossible life without the Holy Spirit. So you need to draw, as Jude said, build up yourselves in your most holy faith. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Begin to pray in, in your English or your Dutch or your German or your Portuguese, whatever you speak, and pray. Begin to draw the word of God into you. Make time for God to minister to you. And hear what God is saying to you and accept what God says about you. There is no clamoring today to judge you. 2,000 years ago, our Savior, I'm sure, screamed as the whip lashed his back, drew flesh from him. I don't think he smiled smugly as they drove a crown of thorns into his head. He was a human man. I'm sure he yelped when they put those nails through his feet and his hands, friends. He did that so that you and I could be free. And it's for freedom we must walk in and take this gospel. For however long gives, God gives us in this earth, I will stand, and having done all to stand, continue to stand, for the battle belongs to the Lord. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning just for prayer? I just want to pray. I haven't time to do an altar call. I'm very sorry. I went over time. But I, I, my prayer is going to be for any man or woman this morning here. And if you do feel the need for prayer, we have time. We, we, we will dismiss the congregation. If you say, Pastor, I, I, you know, I, I'm just like Elijah. I was in the fight, but I got relegated, and I ran, and I, I failed, and I, I have so disastrously affected the testimony of Christ. But you're in good company. Because truth be told, if everybody do everything but everybody here, none of us would have anything to do with anybody. Amen? We are not people that smugly try to present ourselves to a world that we got it all together. That we're not, that we're not, we, we should be the most humble people, friends. We have a God who's got it all together. And he holds us in the palm of his hand. And do you want to join us this morning and get into the palm of his hand? Call upon the name of the Lord. Turn from your sin. Turn to Christ. Christian, turn back to the loving arms of Jesus this morning. Stop believing the lie of the devil. Stop believing the lie. Young people, you're in puberty. It's a difficult time of life. Boys and girls everywhere. He loves you. He's bringing you on. He's going to bring you all the way through. Trust him. He'll make you happy. He'll find you the right spouse, the right job in time. Amen. Trust him. Live as Jerry and, and Jordan this morning. Devout young men. Given to the things of God. Every area of the life. There's no no-go areas. It's all his. Live like that. Elijah went on and he completed his mission on earth and then he got promoted in the most stylish fashion you could ever imagine amazing amen and the day when you and I get promoted I, I saw my father got pr getting promoted on, on, on his deathbed I saw him get promoted and it, it, you know I, I just absolutely you know when Balaam said oh that I may die the death of the righteous and had his death be like mine because he knew that the righteous and the dead were more powerful than the wicked and the living and I've seen that your greatest moment will be your last moments, friends. It'll be the purest moments of your life because there's nothing to barter with. Your dignity is a kind of God. Everyone's kind of looking out, wiping your brow and taking you to the bathroom. And, you know, you have no natural strength in you, but there's a glory that comes into you from God. It's amazing. I've never, ever but been enamored with the death of the saints. It's just been one of the greatest privileges to be around. Even though death is awful and, 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 and death is an enemy, but not for us anymore, friends, because when our debt comes, it comes because God's time is for us to get promoted. And when time of promotion comes, what a moment, what a day that will be. Stay in the fight. He's not angry with you. He loves you. He's not in the, the wind and he's not in the volcano and the earthquake. He's in the still small voice that whispers his love and tenderness to you in the midst of your horrible trial. And he says, you know what? I know what it's like to be cut off from the land of the living. I know what it's like to have everyone abandon, abandon you. I know what it's like to go through a dark night with not a voice or a person's arm around your shoulder because they all ran. And they were all fall short of any sense of comfort. 
so I know what you're going through. Come on, close your eyes for a moment and just ask Christ. Intimately ask him. Oh, Jesus, receive what God is saying to you this morning. Just receive it. Say, Jesus, and ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to take this word and, and you acquiesce in your heart and in your mind, but it's a work of the Spirit to, to bring the full healing. It will happen. You call upon him. There's some here this morning and you're in strife. You're in strife with your, your, your spouse. And you're in strife in, in your family. And you're the, the, you're the, you possibly are the one that messed up. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Do you know what? I always say to couples when they come in, it doesn't really matter to me who messed up. What matters is that are we ready to start receiving the word of God into our lives again that can produce mercy and kindness and flow through us, to us and through us. Father, I pray for every man, woman, boy and girl in court church, Lord, for the hearing and everyone that might hear this message, wherever they might hear it, Lord, <clears throat> that something will quicken in their heart. And Lord, there will be no accusation towards you, Lord, but there will be a reaching out to your love and your mercy, Lord, and a regaining of their life. Elijah did go on, Lord God, a man of light passions for sure. <clears throat> a man, Lord, just like Peter, Lord, who at crucial moments really came up very short and went to dark places. But Lord, we thank you. Oh, love, that will not let me go. We thank you for this, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you would never abandon us, leave us or forsake us. Much as we know, Lord, in ourselves, we probably deserve it, Lord, and a million times over. But you have committed yourself to us. And Lord, we recommit, Lord, not that we're getting saved again. We know we're saved. But Lord, we are commit, recommitting our love to you and making you the center of focus of our lives. So come now, Jesus, and touch me again. Ask the Lord to touch you right now. Please, just use your mouth and say, Jesus, touch me. Please touch me, Jesus. Now also, when you know he's touching you, stand against the enemy and make a very deliberate statement. Say, thus far and no further, in the name of Jesus, we come against the powers of darkness that would take us into these dark places and these dark thoughts. I rebuke those thoughts in Jesus' name. This is from the pit of hell. I rebuke those evil thoughts. I rebuke those thoughts in Jesus' name. God bless you and God keep you this morning. Amen. I, I don't want you to run away. We've got teas and coffee on the ground floor. Connection. I always want to say before you do leave, we don't charge for teas and coffees. You want to make a contribution towards the missions you can. We want you to enjoy fellowship this morning. Amen. God bless you all. But keep the word of God in your heart. Amen. Let's give him praise as we leave this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Bless God.